we're, we're now going to have a, a panel. Uh, we're going to talk about something that's got a lot of national uh, attention. It's an area where we're absolutely convinced that health information technology can play a role, but it's, um, you know, we, we, had a, we had a whole series of a task force in, in Michigan and a whole series of testimony. And um, it was one of the more moving experiences that I think I've been to for testimony of, of just what a, um, what, what a human situation uh, the opioid crisis is. And so um, I, while I think technology can actually help, um, I think it's, it's going to be a whole bunch of people working together to sort of figure our way out of this and, and understand what we're really facing. So I'm really excited about who we have here to kind of walk us through a bunch of different perspectives uh, about what, what the opportunity space looks like in Michigan. Um, you know, we, we, we've got some good technology. We, we can figure out, I think, what's going on. Um, or can we, I guess is maybe a good question. Maybe there's a lot more under the hood than, than is immediately apparent by just looking at the data. So I have a, a lineup of a handful of speakers. I'll, I'll quickly introduce them. Their full bios are in the, in the, in the uh, available at the website. So Dr. Wesley Sargent, a health scientist, opioid overdose, overdose health systems team, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, Dr. Sargent uh, works on implementing the CDC guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain in clinical settings. He's conducting applied healthcare systems research, providing scientific support to state public health departments. Um, he also serves as a science officer in the CDC's Natural, National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, um, Overdose Prevention for States, OPIS, um, where he provides scientific and technical assistance to CDC-funded states. Um, he obtained his Doctorate of Education in, in Professional Counseling and Supervision with an emphasis in program evaluation at the University of West Georgia. Um, I'm going to introduce all the panelists and then we'll come back to, to um, Dr. Sargent to, to kick us off. Next I have Dr. David Neff, uh, Chief Medical Director, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Um, then I've got a few bullets to choose from. So I had a long list of bullets so I'll, I'll pick some of my favorites. Um, so doc, Dr. Neff is, is currently the Chief Medical Director in the Office of Medical Affairs and Medicaid, Medical Services Administration at, at DHHS. Um, his, his most previous role prior was with, with the medical as Medical Strategy Leader for the Cardiovascular Diseases at Merck and Company. Um, he's been involved with large-scale planning programs to address population health related to issues in the areas of cardiovascular disease, diabetes management, and opioid addiction since 2000. He was involved in developing non-opioid pain medications in early 2000s and has been studying the opioid mortality crisis since 2010. Next is uh, Dr. Jim Hunzinga. Um, Dr. Hunzinga is the Chief Medical Officer for APRIS Health, sorry, Chief Clinical Officer. Um, he, he has a professional career that spans multiple disciplines, including services as a, as a U.S. Air Force fighter pilot, um, military flight surgeon, emergency physician, software engineer, an entrepreneur. His current focus is on the application of data science, cognitive ergonomics, and behavioral modification as they relate to substance use disorder. He is, again, the Chief Clinical Officer at APRIS Health. And last but not least is um, Dr. Joyce DeLong, Professor and Chair, Department of Pathology, Western Michigan University, Homer Stryker, MD, School of Medicine, Medical Examiner. Um, uh, Dr. DeLong is the founding chair of the West Michigan University Homer Stryker, MD, School of Medicine. Since then, the department has expanded to include the Center for Neuropathology and a Research Histology Laboratory. Uh, Dr. Long has extensive experience as a medical examiner, currently serving in the role for 11 counties in Michigan. She serves on the, the federal mass fatality team and has been deployed to mass disaster fatality events. She currently is the chair of the medical examiner work group, a team of multiple individuals focused on improving the medical examiner and death investigation process in Michigan. 
So to uh, get us started, we have each panelist is going to do kind of a brief presentation to set the stage and, and frame their corner of, of this large environment. And then uh, we'll, we'll step back and, and um, ask each other questions on the panel. And then we'll turn it over to the floor to let other folks um, ask their questions. Well, thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you, Wes, for starting us off on a conversation where we can go uh, in terms of looking at large degree of information that we're dealing with in an environment where it is constantly changing. As Wes has described, uh, we've at least, uh, we've witnessed at least three phases in the opioid epidemic since the early 2000s. So what I would like to do is share with you some perspectives both from the Office of uh, Medical Affairs at Medicaid and in collaboration with a large number of people who are working in the department uh, in terms of how do we uh, approach this in a very systematic, data-driven manner, uh, along with our, our, our friends in, at LARA and in the Department of Education, and how, how we can embrace this, uh, both uh, from a state government and from a health systems perspective. What I'm gonna do is share with you uh, uh, my conflicts, I have no financial conflicts. Uh, I am full-time at the department. Some of the concepts I'm gonna have are based on ongoing conversations, pro probably in the hundreds, with health systems providers, providers, associations, and others, and taking a look at this from a health system perspective from the state level. So we'll bring in some of uh, uh, the work that we're doing and we'll end up with some of the work that we're doing, but at the same time, how do we look at this a little bit more strategically based on data that tells us exactly what the uh, epidemic looks like in 2018? So first of all, what I, I always like to do when I look at large pieces of data is to stay grounded in some certain guiding principles in terms of how you do this and why are we doing this and what purpose and is, is information that we're looking at actionable? So that's a key question. So uh, the two largest change management uh, models that are out there are Six Sigma and Lean, and certainly Lean Six Sigma is, is part of it. It's been become a standard in industry and in uh, the commercial sector as well as in the government sector in, in several areas. So first of all, we don't know what we don't know. We can't do what we don't know. We won't know until we measure. We don't measure what we don't intend to act upon, and we don't act upon what we don't measure unless we really have to. What I really mean is that if it's eminently life-threatening, we have to work in scenarios where it has a, a, a potential where we have to act with, with data that we have, not necessarily the ideal amount of data, but certainly um, <clears throat> we, in Medicaid, we work uh, sometimes in the fog of war that things are moving very quickly and there may be imminent danger for a beneficiary or for a population. The other key uh, founding principle that creates a baseline for me is to eliminate MUDA. That comes from the lean thinking from Toyota. Six Sigma started with Motorola before it went to Ford and GE. Otherwise, that means is how do we eliminate waste, in inefficiency, or obstacles in getting things done? And this motto is incorporated in every Lean, Lean Six Sigma, Lean Solution project in the world. The other next concept is a concept that we've been discussing about in many arenas when I go to national meetings and as we have discussions here locally with uh, uh, providers. And there are a large number of uh, associations and health systems folks that we've been having conversations on. How do you create a learning health system to improve quality of care and create teachable moments? So the, the learning health system actually started from uh, the work by Peter Senge in the learning organization. It's how do you take information, create it into knowledge, how do you sit down and how do you utilize it in, either at the point of care or at a health system level to help us be able to improve. Now here at the state, we've developed a strategy uh, uh, or a strategic approach where we focus our time and attention based on which agency we work in and what uh, uh, our specific purpose and mission is in order to be able to, uh, to execute very uh, efficiently. So we've broken it down into three areas. 
what can we do in terms of preventing the situation in, to, from occurring in the first place? How do we identify risk and identify uh, eminent danger and create early intervention? And then how do we actu actually treat those people who suffer addiction um, uh, and be able to set up systems of care so that we can take care of them and we can divert them from a pathway of going off the cliff from an overdose death or an imminently uh, long-term scenario. This is an overview of the databases that we look at in, uh, in the department. I thank all my colleagues from across the department. And uh, certainly you can see a large number of them. Uh, death files, uh, files uh, our violent death reporting system, MAPS is a key piece, and Jim will be talking about that. And I'm highlighting that because I wanted to bring two disparate sources of information together and show you how we're using them in, in the Office of Medical Affairs. Syndromic surveillance, inpatient databases, neonatal abstinence, behavioral risk uh, surveillance, youth behavioral surveys, national surveys, treatment episode data sets, naloxone dispensing, poison control, Medicaid warehouse where claims and, and other forms of information exist, fatality analysis reporting system, which Joyce is gonna be talking about, how do we pull those two pieces of information, how do we make it actionable in medical affairs? Locations of prescription disposal sites, locations of naloxone dispensing pharmacies, Medicaid opioid innovation accelerator program. We're working with several different states at the federal level and pulling together data to see what else we can find in terms of relationships. I'll share with you one or two key relationships that we've already found. Locations uh, are in multi-state quality improvement program. Uh, we're working with 12 different states in the University of Pittsburgh on what quality measures mean the mo make the most difference and how do we know whether or not we're bending the needle. Medicaid utilization review reports, which come under our aegis and then uh, the Michigan Open Data Resource for looking at acute pain, which is a primary focus. So the key issue here is how does the information drive our decisions, including our strategy? We know that morbidity and mortality related to opioids still remains high. Uh, I'll show you some information that we're beginning to bend that trend but um, um, uh, we have to ask the question, are we? And then we have to ask the question is, do we really need to look on a regular basis around the facts as we understand them today and modify our strategy or our thinking to get further reductions? Wes has already talked about it. There are three key phases. One is the prescription opioid phase, the other one is the heroin phase, and the other one is the third phase. But most deaths, the ultimate endpoint are related to fentanyl and fentanyl analogs and heroin, followed by prescription opioids. Then cocaine and methamphetamine, you usually see it on the west side of the Mississippi, but we're seeing it here in Michigan and in other states, especially on the other side of Lake Michigan and Wisconsin, there's been, been a big spike. And, uh, uh, and then methadone. Methadone is the only one that's gone down, but as you see these trends, they've all gone up here in recent years. And that really signifies that there is an ongoing interest of mixing and matching to, to uh, realize the effect of mind-altering substances f for reasons perhaps outside of what their intended prescription purpose was. So this is the data that came out. I didn't look at it today, but I've looked at it yesterday, and it's still from May. We see that this data that I just sh we just showed you, uh, uh, we ended up 2016 with just slightly less than 64,000 deaths. The growth rate was 25 point, or 21.5% there, but we're beginning to see a slowdown even though we don't see this. So we look at a month to month variation and we've seen, seen this uh, a beginning trend that the trend is slowing down in terms of the death rate, but we're still seeing close to 69 or 68, over 68,000 deaths, which means a net increase. So we have a lot to good work to do in order to slow down the death rate. Here in Michigan, we're seeing a similar trend, but perhaps even more striking. We don't quite know yet. But there was an 18.7% increase in 2016 of, uh, from December to December, but we're seeing an 8% decrease. And it's gone from a 1% to 2% decrease uh, looking at the data from August of uh, 2017. Then we saw about a 5.5% decrease uh, in September, and now we're seeing an 8% de decrease. So this is the most current data that we have, fully noting that not all the information in, in, in the data has not cured, but it's potentially reassuring. But the, answer, the question is, what else is going on? 
based on the information that we've seen, based on a review of literature from Homeland Security, uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency from C uh, CDC, NIDA, looking at our own data, we've broken it down into four root causes. When the prescription opioid is the problem, when diversion is the problem of the prescription opioid, and when heroin is the problem, and when an illicitly manufactured fentanyl, or IMF, is the problem. There are root causes for each one of them, but we have to kind of understand each of these four factors. Uh, the prescription opioid, there's still work to do. We're seeing some down uh, trends in terms of what's being prescribed, but is it far enough? It's being driven by pain as a fifth vital sign and HCAP surveys. But another key issue is, is when the prescription opioid is being diverted, two thirds of the medicine in the, uh, in the medicine cabinet uh, is being obtained or by the primary person who received the prescription, two thirds of three quarters of the prescribed drugs are bought, stolen, or given away. Leakage in the distribution system is a huge issue and a subject of uh, intense scrutiny by law enforcement. Lost in transit, armed robbery, nighttime break-ins, employee pilferage. And it is occurring here in Michigan and uh, uh, we can perhaps spend some time on that at some other point. And then illegal backdoor sales and distribution through informal networks or organized crime. Heroin is the problem largely uh, distributed by six Mexican cartels. We know that there's at least two of them here in the state of Michigan. It's a $300 billion business in of itself where revenues are only outpaced by Walmart global sales. When illicitly manufactured fentanyl is the problem, it's typically coming from China, either directly to the, uh, the United States through internet sales and or through Mexico or Canada. And if it's coming through Mexico, sometimes it's coming in with heroin supplies where most of the heroin is coming from, not Afghanistan. And then it's many times be re being reassembled by pill presses that are also being broken down, smuggled into the US, and then remanufactured into something that is far from what we would call good manufacturing practices uh, from, from a, um, a prescriber or from a drug manufacturer perspective and what the FDA requires in terms of us, uh, purity of, of substances. It can be prepared for inhalation, including vaping devices that are now ubiquitous or for IV injection. So what's going on with prescription opioids? We found it in a report from uh, uh, April of uh, uh, 2018 by IQ uh, via Institute that we're seeing a decrease, a slight, slight decrease since around 2010 in terms of the, the opioid prescription rate. And it's consistent in all the reports that we're seeing internally and with uh, uh, prescription data that's coming from the MAPS report uh, this year, prescription rates are going down. You're seeing high, uh, if you look at the left uh, right hand panel, you see them dropping more, more uh, uh, at a greater rate, uh, similar but parallel rate uh, uh, for high dose opioids uh, versus low dose, but they're all coming down. And then on the far right lower panel, you're seeing an increase in buprenorphine and MAT related therapies and a decrease uh, 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 in terms of the prescription rates. Here in Michigan, and this just uh, was released uh, uh, with Lara and the department, we're seeing 239,000 fewer prescriptions than two years ago. We're seeing an increase in MAPS in the left upper panel and we're seeing uh, uh, a decrease of multiple provider episodes just because MAPS is being used and people are, are collaborating and, and saying uh, they're finding out when other prescribers are involved and they're having conversations or making decisions not to be part of that. On the far lower, right lower panel, you can see that there's still prescription rates higher uh, uh, north, on the north of the MIT and in the upper peninsula and then in other areas, but uh, then there's, more difficulty in terms of access uh, to care. What is striking from a lesson learned from last year that was reported out just last September is that in Ohio, uh, 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 a report came out that 90% of the unintentional overdose deaths in 24 counties involved fentanyl, fentanyl analogs, or both, whereas heroin was identified in a minority of 6%. And about 23% uh, uh, of decedents had a prescription opioid on board. You can see the list of the fentanyl analogs here. Some of them are catabolites, 
uh, or metabolites, and some of them are actually active drugs, and, and there's a large degree of experimentation going on in terms of taking some of these metabolites and making them the new designer drug. It includes uh, carfentanil and U47700, which we're seeing in Michigan for the first time in October of 2016 after a large outbreak in Cincinnati um, uh, in, in August of 2016. The first case was reported in Kent County in September. This is data that comes from a colleague who shows that uh, uh, of 30 deaths that occurred in Bay County, uh, who, uh, the colleague is an addictionologist and he's also a medical examiner. Of those 30 deaths, 28 had an opioid. Uh, one death was related to a benzo, the other one was uh, alcohol and, and a stimulant. 17 of 28 uh, opioids uh, on board were fentanyl or the fentanyl family. 14 of 17 of those deaths were bootleg non-pharmaceutical fentanyl, and uh, no fentanyl was identified in any deaths four years earlier. What is really interesting here is you see a large amount of fentanyl, and you see some hydrocodone, hydromorphine, uh, tramadol and codeine, but when you do the analysis with MAPS, and this is a key takeaway, uh, another way to use MAPS is when you look at, uh, at autopsy data, you find that there is no correlation with MAPS data when you see prescription opioids on board. So the non-prescription fentanyl outpaced what was seen in MAPS in terms of a, pres uh, a prescription fentanyl, but you'll also see the same thing with benzodiazepines. So uh, about two to one in terms of the benzodiazepines, so even the Valium or the Xanax and whatnot was obtained through non-prescription means. And one might assume, but it's unconfirmed, that this was diverted for uh, uh, controlled substances. So it's another use of MAPS in addition to finding out what's been prescribed and who's prescribing it and, and if there's doctor shopping or inappropriate uh, prescriber behavior. The key issue here is in the end of uh, 2017, heroin and fentanyl are the two largest uh, 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 drug threats in com combination of 70% of the problem in terms of what the end user as uh, uh, defined by someone who responds to a survey by the DEA and Homeland Security says on the street this is what the biggest problem is. It's fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. So what can we do about this? How do we look at this? Number one is begin to model this out and taking all the information we have. Clearly there seems to be two events going on at the same time. One is and this is an evolving model that we've been working with with several stakeholders in various stages of discussion within the department and uh, outside of the department with our stakeholders. Number one is the prescription uh, pathway where the patient reports with pain and an opioid is, is prescribed. If they stay on it for too long, they'll become tolerant dependent within seven days or tolerant within seven days and the addiction becomes uncontrollable and may lead to cardiopulmonary arrest. And most recently, we've discovered a higher incident of permanent brain injury on those who survive an overdose in the field and are discharged from the hospital by about 10%. 10% of all brain injuries are now related to drug overdoses based on some early data that we've been able to evaluate. Um, we haven't confirmed it yet, but it's an interesting signal. And then the other pathway is due to negative cultural influences of whichever way you may describe it, uh, it, it turns into uh, misuse. And they either obtain the, uh, the, the drug illicitly or they, they move back and forth. The, the, it's dynamic and fluid between both pathways. How do we think about this? What might we do? How do we expand uh, beyond our current focus and, and how do we begin to look at that? Number one, it's continue to prescribe less. Number two, we have to decrease demand and then we have to work with other people to de decrease supply to get the illicit opioids off the street. Number three is to improve access to care. If we start pinching on either one of these pathways, we've got to make certain that we have appropriate access to care. And there's a lot of activity and discussion going on there. And number four is we can't abandon the pain patient because in the late 1990s, it all began with that. We weren't treating pain enough. So have we decreased prescriptions sufficiently uh, or do we have more work to go? How do we examine this from a health systems perspective and look at our segmentation map, what are the key issues? One is the incomplete picture in terms of root causes. The other one is despite improvement, uh, there's still work to do on the prescription side. 
we have to get the heroin and the fentanyl off the street or we have to decrease the demand. Now that's a cultural issue. If there's a demand to use it outside of medical reasons, that means we need to get to communities. We have, there is room uh, for us to improve or optimize access to care across the board, across the state. We're working closely with health plans and associations to be able to do that. And then despite stabilization, the death rate is still too high. So we have to approach it from all perspectives. Now, I'm not gonna go into this into great detail, but if you start working on improving access to care to divert the pathway, that is one good start. And then you work backwards in terms of early intervention and risk assessment, and then you go further back in terms of prevention. And then you can begin to map it out. And you, even on the illicit side, you may ask, well, why wouldn't we just leave it to law enforcement? The answer is we cannot. We have to look at it and we have to figure out ways to change cultural mores and expectations. At Medical Affairs, we do the following. We now look at MAPS with every case and when we review Suboxone or MAT uh, requests and for large uh, uh, dose, high dose uh, chronic use medication or for acute pain and we look at MAPS or NARCS care reports but we also look at drug screens. It's a very important piece because MAPS isn't gonna help us what's coming off the street because it's never been registered. Then we combine it with clinical information to look at clinical context. Is it justifiable? Can we see patterns? And is, is there a reason why they may be on a high dose or not? And then we begin to synthesize that. We apply it to guidelines, including MQIC, but it's really a synthesis of national guidelines, including the CDC guideline and ASAM. We look at it in many different ways, but in Medicaid, and with, from a payer perspective, when we work with Michigan Association of Health Plans and the medical directors and the pharmacy directors and the Medicaid health plans, we work on this together. What can we do at prior authorization level? Uh, looking at acute and chronic pain, what do we do with drug utilization review? How do we analyze? And then how do we create an intervention that's a teachable moment? And then we have a 14 table dashboard where we have data that is actionable that gives us an idea of what we will do next. A beneficiary monitoring program or management program, we lack a, a aberrant behavior with one provider, one patient, one pharmacy. There's, we're approaching seven or 1600 beneficiaries where we have in a lock-in program that we're monitoring this very closely. Medication management therapy where a pharmacist can provide uh, 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 additional educational material at the point of sale, and that's underway. And care coordination, we're having more conversations. When we talk about in the managed care setting between uh, uh, physical health managed care organizations and the PHPs, which manage the behavioral health side, because we are dealing with a behavioral and a physical health problem. And in fee for service, we're even looking at finding better ways to connect physical and behavioral health providers. I'll be quick on this. In summer, we can't legislate, regulate, arrest, or spend our way out of this. We need to shrink cultural mores and expectations that this is a good, good thing to do. We can't force people to the street with what we're doing. We can't decrease the, op uh, we must decrease prescription opioid use. We have to get the heroin and the fentanyl off the streets or at least decrease demand. We cannot abandon the life altering pain patient. We need to improve access to care. We need to bolster workforce and infrastructure and build a high quality workforce. We need to support providers taking care of that. We need to support families and social networks and we need to continue collecting better data. None of us, of us can do this individually or alone. We need to do it and data will help us drive our decisions. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm honored to be here today on this panel. Uh, again, I'm Jim Heisinga. I'm a chief clinical officer for APRIS Health. Um, I'm going to move along fairly quickly here to make sure we have some time for questions. So um, just briefly, uh, we're a company that you probably interacted with, um, but you probably never heard of. Um, we, uh, we run uh, pretty much a nation's criminal justice uh, victim notification system. Um, so that means that we have about 80% of all the booking 
um, and incarceration data in real time coming through our system so we can notify victims of violent crimes. We also uh, run a retail fraud division that is pretty much connected into every big box retailer and we, we help pr provide intelligence around return fraud which is um, probably no, nothing here, uh, nobody's ever engaged in that in here, but you probably all returned something. And when you did that, um, most likely that retailer communicated with us to get some intelligence on the appropriateness of that. And then we work in uh, APRIS uh, Health as well, our, th our third division with PDMP programs. So MAPS is a PDMP program, a prescription drug monitoring program. Um, APRIS, we provide uh, the software for about 42 states in the country. There's about 52 programs. Um, we also run a PMP interconnect hub, and that allows all the states to talk to each other. So each state has their own set of rules around data usage. It, it makes uh, imminent sense uh, to share data between the states because patients go back and uh, forth across the borders. Um, and we actually enable that, and about 20 million times a month we're sharing data machine to machine across the states. So we're, we're having good success there. And, we, and we've worked very steadfastly on integrating because this data is only good if it can be accessed and used. Um, and we are in, active in 33 states, and as you'll see later on, we, we delivered about 300 million PDMP reports into workflow last year alone. Um, <clears throat> that footprint, uh, one of the things to glean from that footprint is, is that we as a company get to hear from 42 programs on what they need, what's working, what isn't, and it gives us the ability to kind of think forward a little bit and say, what's, wh where are we going? So that's what I want to focus the rest of my uh, presentation on here is what's happening. So um, this is what a PDMP report looks like. I don't know if uh, everyone in the room has seen one, but this is a basic set of PDMP data. And, uh, what some people might see here is a report, and what other people might see here is a list of prescriptions. But if you're a physician and you're looking at this report to glean risk, uh, to, to make a risk assessment about a patient, this is what it looks like, okay? Um, now I, it's not like my kids took out the crayons and did this. The point of the color is, is that each one of these colors and each one of those boxes is actually an important bit of data that you need to synthesize in order to build a picture of risk. Um, the data is incredibly important. I've been using this data religiously in my practice for uh, over a decade. Um, but at Appers Health, we're trying to make that a little bit better. Um, so we have um, developed and deployed a, a set of scores that now uh, come in on top of that data. They help gauge awareness to the amount of risk that's embedded in that report if you very carefully looked at it. Uh, importantly, these scores are not abuse scores. A uh, high score does not mean that you cannot prescribe a medication. We're very careful about how we educate people on these use, use cases for these. But uh, the scores really numerically represent the data and they allow it to be used uh, for essentially every encounter. Um, we've also, we, all, we do have a goal of, of providing the very best composite overdose risk assessment um, in a numerical format so that providers, again, can uh, stop and pause and slow down the encounter when they see risk like that. We're bringing additional risk indicators in and we're also graphing information out so that, you know, those individual patients who have those very individual um, care plans and individual histories, you can see the elements of that history in a way that allows you to personalize the care for the patient. So what you're seeing here is on the right is the data, but on top of that data is this analyzed and displayed and graphically enhanced version. So this um, really does help. Uh, if you are just looking at the manual data, the data itself, uh, you'll probably make good decisions a decent number of times, but we want to have providers make the best decision possible with a minimum amount of time because everybody's time compressed. So when you look at our overdose risk score and you compare, which takes into account many, many factors from a machine learned, very advanced data science team, um, and you look at the ability of that to find risk compared to just like a single factor, like milligram equivalent dose, so the amount of medication someone uses is in blue, and the overdose risk score is in orange here, and what you can see is as you would expect, a data science team that looks at the problem and creates a very complex model uh, can do better than just looking at one factor. So we continue to want to improve this. Um, so machine learning and scoring is really helping to advance the state of art when it comes to awareness. Uh, integrations is uh, the next big thing that um, we're working on. Um, our idea of an integration is, is that the PDMP data automatically shows up with no effort on the providers. 
Um, that, and that means that sometime between when the patient arrives either at the pharmacy or the doctor's office, or and the provider gets in the room or the pharmacist sees the patient, that the check has occurred automatically. Um, this is pretty important. Uh, we've done, uh, we have integrated with Kroger nationwide, and at one point in time they had about half their pharmacies integrated, half not. And they did their own study and they published this online and what they found is that, as we would hope, you know, PDMP data is supposed to help the problem. As Dave said, uh, one of the things we need to do is reduce inappropriate prescription opioids in society. When we look at what uh, Kroger found on their own, they found that a 500% increase in PDMP reviews occurred and the combination of the scoring and the graphics led to a 2.5% decrease in the number of opioids that were dispensed from the pharmacies that were integrated compared to the pharmacies that weren't. Um, so certainly some good evidence there that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and again, the, the combination of integration, which happens automatically, and a scoring representation that does not harm the patient, does not label the patient, but allows the provider to understand the quantity and depth of data available and the risk that's there, really works. Here's an example of what it looks like to a provider. They're in their electronic health record, they're getting ready to go see the patient, and a series of scores from the PDMP, from MAPS, shows up automatically for a glance. And as a provider, I can tell you that after I understand how these scores work, I can look at them and in less than a second begin to incorporate the PDMP viewpoint into the care of the patient. It, it far surpasses the mandatory use. Um, it allows it to be, it allows the PDMP data to be used for every encounter realistically. Again, we had, we've integrated with every manufacturer to make this easy. We've talked with Epic, Cerner, NextGen, you name it. We've been working with them for two years. The integration is now built into the software. Most systems in Michigan do not have to do much at all to integrate. Um, we're working now on embedding uh, real functionality. So uh, everyone in here, I'm sure, has used a online travel resource to book an appointment uh, or book a flight. You've used Open Table probably to get a restaurant uh, seat. You've used WhatsApp and Gmail, and you know most of you are probably emailing right now, and that's fine. I don't uh, begrudge any of that. Um, but uh, you know we are wanting to bring these types of high-end functionalities right into the PDMP. Um, and here's an example of that going live in Michigan later this year is the ability for providers to talk to each other directly through the platform. One provider to the next, as simple as clicking on a name on the report and you can talk to that person. Really good for pharmacists, I think, because so often they have so much to add to the equation, but they just have a communication barrier, so we're gonna fix that. We have the CDC guidelines immediately accessible right inside the application. We have referral tools. Our goal is by this time next year that when you find a patient who a, has a problem and you want to get them assessed or get them an appointment, you can do that right through this, the platform with just a click or two. Um, we are uh, working on bringing non-fatal overdose, which is, if you think about it, a prescription drug monitoring program should be all about prescription drugs, but the problem is, as Dave and Wes have both pointed out, it's, it's morphing way beyond prescription drugs. So uh, an example of a non-prescription drug data point, non-fatal overdose, is, is incredibly important. We're bringing that into the PDMP. We're bringing it into the scores so that someone who has maybe very little controlled substance usage through, through, as evidence through MAPS, but who's had an overdose in the last year, the provider won't be inadvertently misinformed about the risk on that patient. We br we're bringing those viewpoints together. Um, and again, I wanted to be brief, uh, so I'm gonna end right there. Thank you very much for your time. Good morning. Let me see if I just go forward here, is that mine? Oh, they'll bring it up. So I'm Joyce DeYoung. I am the founding chair of pathology at Western Michigan University's uh, uh, School of Medicine. It's, also, it's actually Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine, which is quite a mouthful. But we did just graduate our first class of physicians, so we're proud of that. It's no small task. I'm also, in addition to being the chair of pathology, I am the medical examiner for 11 counties in Michigan, so that's uh, where my data and information comes from. It's, uh, it's a big footprint. There are six forensic pathologists in our department. Uh, we cover a population of 1.1 million, a lot of square miles, and we have a lot of deaths reported to us, and we do a lot of autopsies. But this is kind of, our, our counties are not contiguous. The yellow ones are where I'm the medical examiner, and it seems a little 
odd, but we actually, you know, Grand Travers and Leland all, we skip down, we have Mason and Osceola, then Muskegon, and then the rest are all in Southwest Michigan. The Green County's there we perform the autopsies for, but I'm not the medical examiner. We actually also do some work for Northern Indiana. So this is, these are the counties that, um, where, where my experience comes from. Uh, but, but I want to back up for just a second because I think that there's one of these, um, you know, how do we know if a death is actually opioid or drug related? This is the theme of so, so many topics. It's like, well, it's a drug overdose. It's why they died. But, but that's more of a complex question. And it doesn't start with, um, it, it, uh, in every time that, that a body is found or somebody is found dead or reported dead or even if it's at the hospital, actually most of our deaths occur outside of the hospital. Uh, but there's an investigator who goes to the scene and they gather information and, and photographs and, and what they found at the scene. And is there, is there a... Um, do, does it appear that there's, there's uh, uh, illicit drugs at the scene or drug paraphernalia? A medical history is taken. We then perform a complete autopsy. In medicine, it, uh, it requires a complete autopsy to determine, uh, to make that diagnosis. And we follow that uh, and correlate that also with the toxicology. Our toxicology is very different if you're a clinician and you work in an emergency room, you probably do urine drug screens, which picks up some things, but it doesn't pick up all these fentanyl analogs. And even if the level is low, it's not going to pick up your opioids. We make the diagnosis of drug-related fatalities based on testing of blood. We do comprehensive testing as well as uh, testing for fentanyl analogs, other designer drugs as well. And, it, and the, the statement on the right there is from the National Association of Medical examiners, that the interpretation, you can't just look at a number and say, well, this is, uh, uh, this is a drug overdose. It, uh, it requires a correlation with all of the other information that you gather. Uh, the longer I've been doing this, the numbers mean less and less to me, and you can't pull out a table and say, well, look, you know, their, their carfentanil level is really low, so it's probably not a carfentanil uh, overdose overdose, usually if you find one of those analogs, it, it's related. However, so that's kind of how we get to that conclusion. This is how it's supposed to be done. This is how we do it in all of our counties, and I think most of, uh, a lot of Michigan does it this way. There are other counties, though, that still, at, at this point, they draw some blood, or they'll get some urine, and they'll send it off, and based on what those findings are, without even really knowing if they've ordered the right test, have they ordered the fentanyl analog testing, uh, a, a determination is made, and they f sort of figure, well, gee, if, it, if, the, if I don't find anything, it must have been their heart. So, so we do know that our data isn't complete. In our system, and, and with a lot of it, uh, we use a, I'm trying to remain free of commercial bias here, so, uh, but our database, it is an online system. It's used all over the country, and a lot of the counties in Michigan use it. We have 83 counties, and obviously our, our 11 use it, but also Washtenaw and Kent County and Ottawa, a lot of other counties use it. It's online. We've been using it since 2008, and, and from in our office, if it isn't in there, it didn't happen, it didn't exist. So we have all of the circumstances, photographs, all in searchable uh, database format. So we have a lot of information, even right down to um, you know what physician prescribed. When we find prescription bottles at the scene, regardless of what it is, we want the information from there. And what it looks like, um, we have a couple other features here too. So our toxicology laboratory has an interface with our with our software system, and we can look at the toxicology results and we just check off whether we think that that drug contributed to the death or not. If it did contribute and it's a drug related fatality, so in this case that I'm showing here where I'm showing uh, the fentanyl and the six monoacetyl morphine as well as the morphine. If you have mo morphine and six monoacetyl morphine, that, that equates to heroin. So by checking those three boxes, the death certificate uh, would be presented to me and I have the ability to edit it, but it would show up as, as a um, fentanyl and heroin uh, overdose. Uh, the other thing that you see down there on, or on the right hand side of their screen is something that happens at the scene. So our investigators are out at the scene and they find a bottle of, of, uh, of Valium. They enter all of the information in here, uh, including the physician's name, where it was filled, and, and it's actually an interesting searchable database from the standpoint of sometimes we can actually look and see. Um, uh, we, we can search this for the physician's name and say, look at it, they have quite a few drug-related fatalities, but um, then we have to find somebody who cares to gather that information. What we're seeing, in, yeah, I mean, we look at it and go, huh, look, it's Dr. You know, it's Dr. Smith again. No, no, no surprise. But um, what, we're, what we're seeing in, in our counties, uh, and, and I pulled out the suicides from here because we see drug-related deaths from suicides which sometimes uh, have opioids and illicit uh, drugs, but uh, oftentimes they just find whatever. 
uh, and they're kind of a, it's a different beast and the numbers are actually fairly low, which is uh, they're too high, but yet they're fairly low. But for 2017, we had 224 uh, drug-related deaths, and 171 or 69% of those had an opioid in them. Not all of them do, uh, and so we still will find uh, cocaine and methamphetamine and other other uh, drug-related fatalities that we believe to be accidental uh, that are. Um, that don't have an opioid, but the vast majority do have an opioid in them. What I think is really interesting though is that 60% of them have at least one illicit drug on board. So sometimes you can't tell, So some, but, but, but uh, uh, the really high percentage of them, if we see methamphetamine or if we see heroin or if we see a fentanyl analog or if we see um, something called 4-AMPP, which is a, uh, it's a precursor to fentanyl and it shows that this is not made in a, in a pristine pharmaceutical company a laboratory that instead it came out of a clandestine laboratory, we can say that that's illicit. Uh, but so 60% so of them, although uh, have an illicit substance on board. The example that I showed previously of the uh, patient th th that actually was a drug-related fatality and they had uh, Valium, they had a recent prescription for Valium, uh, they didn't have any, uh, they didn't have Valium in their system, which sort of suggests, again, this diversion that they, they got a prescription for it. There were a number of them missing. They didn't have any um, th that was not in their blood, so you, you figure um, that they weren't using that, but maybe diverting it, maybe, tr you know, maybe swapping it, who knows what, what was happening there. This is just showing that on a, a different uh, mechanism. So most of our drugs, uh, most of our drug-related fatalities do have opioids there and a very high percentage of them as well have an illicit substance in every one of our counties. We do find some counties, I mean, uh, it, it, I don't have the populations on here, but there was, uh, it was 2016 where Calhoun County, which is Battle Creek, had a higher number of uh, opioid-related deaths than Kalamazoo County, just uh, b although their population is about 100,000 less. So some of our counties have a bigger problem than, than others. We have another program going as well. I think that the name has been changed, and maybe you reference that, but they're changing it because MORT is also, there's a, a My Mort, which is a, a Michigan Mortuary Operational Response Team, which is a team that responds to mass fatalities. I'm a part of, um, of rapid uh, fatality response teams. This was called MORT, Michigan Opioid Rapid Testing, but I, I don't know what the new name was. It looks like you had it. So they, want, they didn't want the, the DMORT or the My Mort people to think that they were getting funding when in fact it was going here. So, <laughs> but, um, but we're looking here, that these, these are samples, what we've asked our medical examiners to send, just a tube of blood for every case. Doesn't matter what the case is, whether it was a pedestrian hit by a car, whatever the scenario, send a tube of blood. Actually, we asked for two tubes in case the toxicologist drops one, but they send, um, they send a couple tubes of blood, and they, they indicate whether uh, they believe that this is an overdose, whether opioids were suspected. Was it a death in a care facility? If it was, there's a big, higher chance that there may be prescription opioids there, and some basic demographics about age and, and uh, uh, information like that. Um, these get mailed in and, and they're tested. And what we found is that, what, what I thought was interesting when I look at this, uh, there's a lot of interesting information, but that most of the time um, that if, a, if the forensic pathologist or the medical examiner believes that an overdose is suspected, they're right to a significant proportion of the time, like 210 out of 250. If an OD is not suspected, we're still finding opioids positive without naloxone. So we removed naloxone from there. So still a, a very hyper, uh, high number 156 out of the 512 uh, had had the opioids positive, and then if the they they have the option to say they don't know if it's an overdose, uh, but even that about half of them have opioids positive without naloxone. So we're, we're still also seeing, uh, even though it may not be an opioid related fatality, if you're the pedestrian hit by a car or in a motor vehicle accident, you're the driver, whatever, we're, you may have died from your injuries. However, uh, o opioids are being identified in those cases as well. So. The simply looking at drug-related fatalities and overdose deaths alone doesn't reflect the full mortality uh, of, of what's happening. So like I mentioned, they're 84% suspected and found, so. So I'm going to wrap this up. There is a lot of information in every medical examiner's office. Um, but it's really haphazard. Even our MORT project is on a uh, spreadsheet, which um, 
isn't isn't ideal. Uh, but we, we really need a centralized database for Michigan for all of this information. I think, uh, uh, as Dr. Neff pointed out, we, we, you don't know what you don't know. And to have that additional information uh, centralized somehow from all of our counties uh, and looking to even evaluate the quality of it would be uh, of significant value, I think, in, in addressing this issue. Thank you. A little bit how um, these phases, okay? I mean that that seems scary. Um, what is it that we can do? I guess that um, you know hospitals, other care facilities, the examiner's office, the state, CDC. I mean, where where's the intersection point here for everyone to to kind of uh, add the technology equation in? So um, some of those pieces now are just um, kicking off now as far as the technology piece. Um, so I think everybody's alluded to it, is finding um, the intersection where um, these data can intersect, where there can be integration, where it can be in the hands. So having the right data at the right time um, in a very um, digestible, um, action-oriented uh, way um, definitely facilitates that. So that's uh, some of the work that we've been doing with overdose prevention in states, um, trying to wrap up, um, having rapid uh, and timely data um, in a quick manner so that um, the Department of Health, the State Department of Health, local Department of Health um, all have that data. So um, as I alluded to on the second to last slide as well, is having that data and being able to push it out um, in a timely manner. Um, and then being able to, so I know uh, Joyce mentioned it as well, um, being able to um, have the integration as well. So um, having the medical examiners, having the coroners to be able to have that data when they are conducting their studies um, so they don't have to go and search it out. Being able to have the, um, an interface integrated into the PDMP or other sources of data. And so I know that um, CDC is continually to um, uh, continue funding um, states um, that have applied, um, whether it's through the enhanced uh, state op um, over opioid overdose surveillance or prevention for states or data-driven prevention initiative. All that is uh, going into enhancing and maximizing health, uh, health IT, specifically some PDMPs. I know that there was just uh, some supplemental funding um, that went into the um, ESAW states. Again, that's the enhanced surveillance or enhanced state opioid overdose surveillance. And 60% of that funding had to um, go to really ramp up um, toxicology testing to really, because um, I know there's a heavy burden on the medical examiners and coroners um, to be able to strengthen that funding. So. I think if we go back to our segmentation map, it's really clear to me that we have to expand our thinking and redefine the epidemic as it exists in 2018. That's number one. And then number two is we can change our thinking on how we will address that. Uh, maybe in terms of continuing to press down because I honestly believe there is room for improvement and we are seeing a small percentage of outliers when we look at utilization review data and MAPS data and uh, we are seeing some high morphine equivalent doses uh, for individuals that uh, when you do a MAPS report, it looks like it's probably being diverted. And a couple, few small cases where the doses are so high that it's unbelievable that they would be still alive. Uh, number two is, with, is the diversion piece, is number, uh, not only in terms of take back programs, that's a small sliver in time in terms of exposure time on when someone can get what's in a medicine cabinet, you have to put it under lock and key and make certain it's not on the, on the kitchen counter, in the medicine cabinet, on the coffee table, or um, in the car uh, without it being locked. So uh, I, I would really encourage that we, we talk about lock it up uh, and take it seriously. Uh, and there's some pretty amazing instances where people are pilfering medicine in, out of homes and then um, out of the workplace. Um, there are, the, in terms of what's going on in, in terms of the drug supply, issue, I think we got to think clearly about that. I saw something in Allegan County, uh, a uh, transit uh, of, uh, 
a cargo van was involved in an accident and the only thing missing was the prescription opioid. <laughs> now it makes you wonder, was that an accident or what? So, uh, there, you know, in terms of supply chain, we need to continue to work on that. And then clearly, the, the use of the heroin is, uh, and the fentanyl is you're either addicted or tolerant to a prescription opioid, which we know there is an entry pathway there, or you've started it for pleasurable or uh, 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 experimental situations, most likely at a younger age. Heroin is still the number one cause of uh, death in, in people between 15 and 19 uh, at this point. And then, the, uh, and then we, need to, to, we need to get in a community. There is an interest of the organized health system to work with families against narcotics and start getting down at the grassroots level along with the DEA. The DEA has some of the best educational resources around, and I would encourage everyone to go look at that and the community involvement in terms of them being there because they know they can't arrest their way out of that. So uh, those are, are good ways to start. And I'll just Someone in control of this? Yeah. Is it working now? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I think Dave and Wes have, have covered most of it there. I, I, I would say technology intersection is, is around data, of course, but it's not more data. I think we, we have plenty of data. What we need to do is make the data more available. We need better data and we need it more um, actionable. In order to do that, I would just contribute that. You know, we really need to think about as a system, everybody in the room, everybody at the uh, tables up here, we need to think about breaking the data silos down and making it available to the clinicians and the pharmacists who ultimately are going to be the ones that uh, help the patients and, and help turn this. So, uh, whatever you can do to help break those silos down, make the information more available and more digestible is what I, I think is our best course. I'm just going to second that. As a medical examiner working with all of these counties, we have different hospitals in them. and. One of our biggest challenges yet is just getting medical records on what, what was this patient's medical history. And we'll contact the hospital and they print it off and put it in the mail, U.S. Postal Service, and send it to us or they will fax it to us. Um, and then we upload that and, and you just, you know, there's just got to be a better way to access. We, we didn't get a fax that's non-searchable. You can't look for a certain text. So you get, you know, 380 pages of something that is really is is very time consuming and and in this day and age it just would seem to be better that we want we just want access to information in order to make good diagnoses and make you know determine what happened to this person for a whole variety of reasons but certainly for public health purposes it's a huge issue to have that so making and break down those silos and allow people who maybe should have access to sort of have it in a searchable way rapidly and accessible same with the uh, uh, and we've been talking as well, just even with the MAP system, how, how can that, how can we improve that so that, for example, if a patient died of a drug overdose, how do we let their clinicians know so that they can be informed about what happened with their patient? So, thank you. And I always think of other, um, I, other uh, responses after listening to um, panelists. So, um, one other piece I would like to emphasize too is really honing in and strengthening uh, local community engagement. Uh, that's huge right there. Um, so being able to fund uh, local community-based um, organizations, again, um, as I mentioned earlier, those are the ones that um, are able to best respond to those at risk. Um, and then also I do want to highlight again also the um, coordinated care within um, healthcare systems. So what I mean by that is really interdisciplinary uh, teams and inter interdisciplinary approach. So having a pharmacist, having a physicians, having um, psychiatrists or psychologists, having licensed clinical social workers, patient advocates, all of those on hand, um, so that there's the warm handoffs within the healthcare systems that are able to uh, link those uh, people that have um, experienced a non-fatal overdose to the care that they need. So. We have a question up here. Yeah, I just want to comment. I think there's a sense of urgency to get it out, out of the autopsy uh, in the morgue, uh, get it to real time to the emergency rooms when that's the next intervenable point to the hands of the addictionologist to identify that. But how do we get this in real time where we see alerts and we may be able to avert uh, disasters? So getting this information in real time so you can do something that's very actionable to prevent a death rather than wondering why someone died 
uh, uh, is, is going to be the key challenge here in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, thank you, Tom Simmer um, from Blue Cross, but also uh, co-chair of the Health Information Technology Commission in Michigan. And we are struggling with creating under a CDC grant um, award to people at the University of Michigan a statewide surveillance system for opioid overdoses. We also want to do this in a way that um, is consistent with other methods um, and avenues of reporting um, through the state, especially through the Mayhin hub. And I'm interested in any comments by the panelists. And incidentally, this was an absolutely fantastic set of presentations. All of you did a, a superb job, and I, I wish we had another hour t to talk about this, but I know we, uh, I, we've already are running over now. But if you have any advice to us as how we can make sure that we set up a really good surveillance system in Michigan that meets the need and also achieves um, using the current avenues of um, information transmission, I'd really be interested in your comments. Oh, yeah. I'll jump in real quick on that. Um, how, I think, is really, you're probably in a better position to, to do your, determine how, but from a goal perspective, as Dave was talking about with real time, you know, I, right now, you know, the, the overdose death data that comes out that becomes informative is a year or two old. And the system should allow a feedback loop that can uh, inform clinical decision support within months, probably at the maximum of a, of a death. Um, because it's a, it's a very dynamic problem and it's changing and uh, it's ge geographically changing. And those geographies as they change, you know, it can help direct resources. So timeliness, I think, you know, if, if you could push for a solution that can generate results, death data results in months rather than a year or two, I think that'd be the very best. I think as a person or representing an office where we get uh, so many requests for our data, it's a bit overwhelming, and uh, we're already, you know, like I said, we're dealing with faxed results and faxed documents that we can't even get the information. We're a fully staffed office. We have our, uh, we, we uh, over, nearly 100% of our reports are signed out within 30 days, so it's there. We're the exception, though. That's pretty unusual for medical examiner offices because there's a huge lack of, uh, or, or lack of numbers of forensic pathologists. But, but making it easier for the office to report it is what you need to do. And, and don't just say, well, you know, do this for us. Um, you need to provide assistance to do that. 